We read in the Bible, God's ways are not our ways. His greatness is unsearchable. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. It says in the Bible, he does what he pleases and he's not answerable to me or to you. It says in the Bible, who are you, man, who replies against God? Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. And that means exactly what it says. His kingdom rules over all. There is absolutely nothing that God does not rule over. If there was one thing, whatever it might be in the universe, which is outside the control of God, he would not be God of that thing. So absolutely everything, without exception at all, whether we're thinking of the smallest atom, or whether we're thinking about the largest nation, or the most monumentous event, his kingdom rules over all. Matthew 25 verse 32 paints a picture of one of the largest prophetic events yet to happen. It states, all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will have rule over that monumentous day. Now, I want you to look at the end of Ephesians 1 verse 11. It states, According to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, God is in complete control of all things everywhere at all times. Nothing surprises him or catches him off guard. Whatever it is, whatever you can think about, whatever you've ever heard about, God controls it. He controls nature. The worldview looks at the universe as a clock, that God winds it up and he walks away. And then the universe takes off all on its own. It isn't that way according to the scripture. You see, God usually acts in the same way all the time. Therefore, because he nearly always acts in the same way all the time, people can say that when something falls, it falls at a certain speed. When light travels, it travels at a certain speed. And they think they are defining laws. This is where we get the laws of the universe. For example, the laws of gravity, the laws of aerodynamics, and so on. In fact, all they are doing is observing God's actions. Sometimes, of course, God acts differently. And then everyone says, it's a miracle. It actually isn't a miracle. It's what we call an extraordinary act of providence. It means that God is acting differently from the way he normally acts. And people would say, oh, the laws of nature have been broken. They haven't been broken. It's just God acting differently. Psalm 147 verse 15 to 18 backs up what I've just stated about God and his power over nature. It states, he sends out his command to the earth. His words run very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. This verse shows us that God forms the snow by a direct word, by a direct command. He scatters frost like ashes. He casts out his hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. So there's the frost, there's the hail. And in other Psalms, we see that there is lightning, there is ice, the wind blows, and God is in command of all of it. It all happens because of his word. That makes nature very exciting. We walk out into the world and we see that God is in action. God also has power to control creatures and every wonderful beast of this world. God is sovereign over all of them. Every animal you can think of, all the animals of the sky as they saw across the first heavens, 
God is in control of them. The animals of the land and the animals of the sea, God is in control of all of them. A perfect example of this is Jonah. He's running away from God, so God sends a great wind. This once again shows God's power over nature. The sailors then proceed to throw Jonah off into the sea. But God has prepared a fish. God has power over creatures. Jesus himself said in Matthew 10, 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. Even the littlest bird, the smallest bird you see flying, even if it falls to the ground, it is because God is controlling that event, which people would say is unimportant and insignificant, that it doesn't matter, but nonetheless, God is still in control. Not only does God have the power to control nature and to control all the beasts of the world, God has the power to control life events. A perfect example of this is the life of Joseph. Here are some brothers. They are jealous of their younger brother. They put him into an empty waterhole to die. But they change their mind and then sell him off into slavery in Egypt. And you all know the story of Joseph. He goes into Potiphar's house and then ends up in prison and then meets different people there in prison. And eventually, he becomes the second most powerful man in the world, second only to Pharaoh. And then of course, he's the one who stocked up on the grain for seven years of famine. And when the famine comes, he releases the grain. And this is the same grain that saves the lives of his brothers. And then at the end, when their father is dead, the brothers are afraid of Joseph, that Joseph will be wanting revenge and vengeance. This is what Genesis 50 verse 20 says. Joseph speaks to his brothers and he says, As for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. The brothers were wicked. They were spiteful. God knows nothing about wickedness and nothing about spite and yet God is sovereign and so wonderfully king that he's even in perfect control when wicked men do their worst I want to read other versions of this verse you intended it to harm me but God intended it for good God has a plan for your life even when friends enemies and even when family members are plotting against you God will turn what they meant to harm you for your good. You see, the brother's wickedness in selling Joseph into Egypt was actually the means by which God saved them from certain death themselves. We as humans can only see what's in front of us. But God can see what will happen 5 years, 10 years, 20 years from now. We grossly underestimate how calculated and how methodical God is. God is in control. God's plan is still coming to pass. Nothing is holding it up or even delaying it. God is perfectly in control. It's all in God's hand. Every circumstance is in God's hand. Now the Bible takes hold of this immense truth and wraps it up as a great gift and presents it to us Christians. And therefore, the Apostle Paul stands up before every Christian that has ever been and that is now. And he says, And we know that all things work together for the good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Because God loves believers. He loves Christians. He loves the people that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves them. And because he's in complete control of every detail, he makes every detail work together according to his marvelous plan. Do you believe that all things work together for your good? When things go wrong and there are tears in your eyes, when that thing happened to you, 
that you thought only happened to others? Do you believe that all things work together for your good? When your heart is bleeding through disappointment and you don't know how anyone can help you or advise you or even understand, do you believe that it is working together for your good? As Christians, we can know that when our faith is being tested severely, we can know that all things work together for the good for us. God is faithful. God is faithful. Well, some might say, can Satan not throw a spanner in God's works? God even has control over Satan. If you ever read the book of Job, you'll find that Satan cannot even move without first getting permission from God. Often we are motivated, excited, and happy as things are sailing smoothly and making great progress. In the midst of it all, a storm ascends. The storms and trials we are not anticipating. Because if the truth be told, we don't know what the future holds and what we'll have to deal with. A sudden illness, a breakup with a partner, the loss of a job or a contract. It is easier to feel disheartened and hopelessness. But let me remind you, God is not a man that he should lie. Numbers 23, 19. God does not make promises that he will not fulfill. God's ways are not our ways. We think naturally, but God is supernatural. God has answers to our problems that we could never think of. God would have never allowed us to encounter those storms if they were going to keep us from reaching our destiny and purpose. We may question God and ask why he has allowed storms in our lives to be so severe to the point where we lose faith and hope. But I want you to remember that it is all part of the process. The good news is God is in control of the winds, the waves, and the storm. He is in control of what's trying to stop you from reaching your dreams, purpose, and destiny. God only has to shift the winds, and instead of holding you back, they will push you forward. The storms were meant for your harm, but God will turn them into your advantage. God is still saying you will get there. God is still on the throne. God is fighting your battles behind the scene. He is assembling the right people. What God has promised you, it will still come to pass. Now I have a question for you. Will you trust God when you do not see any signs of things improving? Will you stay in faith when you are hearing those small voices in your head telling you that it is never going to work out. I want you to remember this. You cannot be moved by what you see. You have to be moved by what you know. And what you know is the Word of God. Do not let the storm make you lose faith in what God has promised. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That is the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. The beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. God is the Almighty God. Our minds cannot understand this term, Almighty God. When we look at the creation, we get a little idea of what it means to be the Almighty God. Our human minds can't comprehend the magnitude of God. And in all honesty, if we could comprehend and understand God with our minds, He wouldn't be God. You can't fit an infinite God 
into a limited mind. Isaiah 66, verse 1. The heaven is his throne, and the earth is his footstool. Heaven cannot even contain God. What makes you think our minds can contain him? No human can say what he looks like, but the scripture has rightly told us that God is a spirit, beholding his glory and power over the heavens and the earth. He sits on his throne in heaven where the saints, the 24 elders and the angels bow before him in awe and worship. God in his fullness and power created the whole world. He has been in existence since before the creation of the world. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This passage has given us a clear indication that God was before the world began. Hence, he is the Almighty, that no man can question. In our context, we shall examine five great lessons about God. God is Spirit. John chapter 4 God is Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The level of your operations in the spiritual realm solely depends on your level of intimacy with God. We are not entitled to come to his presence without our spirit aligned with the spirit of God. God is not just our maker, but is a spirit. And whoever wants to operate in a godly dimension must be spiritual. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth and so, those that are in the flesh cannot please God. The relationship between man and God is spiritual. So, the spirit of the man must be a regenerated one. The term worship simply means absolute surrender as a result of an encounter. Worship is not the solemn song we sing. It goes beyond that. There are different ways to worship God. We can show some acts of worship by giving offerings, dancing, clapping hands, sewing, and the likes. But the best way to worship God is by surrendering our lives to Him. You cannot come before Him as a carnal person and expect spiritual results. Only those that walk in the Spirit are expected to operate in the spiritual with power and vigor. God is love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word love means giving, sacrificing, and services to humanity. For God so much loved the world that he sent his only son to reconcile us back to Christ. Hence, man has gone astray from the beginning. Your mind is not big enough to fully grasp his love for you. He knows everything about you. He knows when you sit down and when you rise up. He knows every single one of your thoughts, even before you think it. You will never surprise him. He knows what you are going to do before you do it. He knows all your desires. He knows what is in your heart. He sent his only son for you. He sent him down to earth, knowing that he would sacrifice himself and die for you. He did all that 
just to save you. He did all that just so you could have the chance at eternal life with him when the world was drowning and it desperately needed a savior. If our greatest need had been information, he would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, he would have sent a scientist. And if our greatest need had been money, he would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, he sent a savior. He chose you, but do you choose him? He loves you, but do you love him? When you were lost, he found you. When you were broken, he mended you. When you cried, he comforted you. You have no idea what you mean to God. He only wants the best for you. You are precious to him. He would never want to harm you, but yet you hurt him. You know he hates sin, and yet you act this way. God has given us his laws with the best interest at heart, and all he gets from us is disobedience, and then when something goes wrong, we blame him. If only you would listen to him, if only you would hear his word, if only you would obey his commandments. There is so much heartache you could have avoided, so many tears that did not need to be shed. If only you would listen to him, God would never steer you wrong. God is not the one out to get you. How could he be when he sent his only son to save you? God shines his light into our life, but all we ever do is run into the darkness. You choose to love a human more than him. And when they hurt you, he is the one who fixes you. When they lie to you, he is the one who holds the truth. And when they leave you, it is he who will always be there for you. God is indescribable. No mortals can truly describe how God is. However, the beauty and greatness of a man can't be compared with that of God because we can't tell how big, tall he is. 1 King 8.27 But God will indeed dwell on the earth. Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee how much less this house that I have built. What a God. Because of his awesomeness, we are indebted to him in showing and giving him what he truly deserves. However, he deserves our worship and praise. In the scripture, we have been admonished for not showing our profound gratitude for his creation the extent of which he can operate, and the levels of his supremacy. The Bible speaks of his hands so that we can understand that he is very powerful. The Bible sometimes talks about his mouth, but that in order for us to understand that God speaks. The Bible sometimes to the eyes of the Lord but that's so we can understand that nothing happens outside of his scope and vision. God sees everything and everywhere at all times. No man has seen God. No man can see God and live. Our bodies can't handle his glory and power. The great creator, the great God, God is everywhere. Jeremiah 23, 24. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? God is everywhere at all times. We cannot understand such a God as this. God is holy. In his words, holiness is mentioned several times as it becomes the only criteria to see him 
as he is. Whoever comes to the Father must approach him with a pure and sincere heart without any blemish. God's eyes can't behold inequities. One of the reasons why prayers are not answered is because of sins. In this dispensation, God demands our clean hearts if we must come to his presence. Holiness is the surest way to see heaven. It doesn't please God to see his children ensnared by the evil tactics of the devil. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. God is powerful and mighty. The supremacy of God and majesty of God cannot be described. Hence, he holds all power in his hands. It doesn't matter how powerful any man or spirit could be, but is still limited when compared to that of God. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man. God is never weak. His power never fails or frails. He does not need time to gather his resources. He does not answer to no man nor any spirit. He is supreme. He does wonders and makes his name to be praised among all nations. It is through the name that demons bow and call him the Almighty God. No one is to be compared with him, with his power. He holds the whole world in his hands. This shows how powerful God is. The sovereignty and supremacy of God have given us a clear indication that no one can be seen as him. His creation speaks for him and therefore let no man take any glory. All glory must be ascribed to God for who he is. He deserves to be worshiped. But there is a wonderful thing about God. His personal spirit can be known. You can become his friend. He has had friends in the past. We see in the Bible that people become the friends of God and he becomes theirs. Open up your heart to him, and he will become your friend. Obey his laws, and he will be your friend. Trust him with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and he will become your friend. The Presence of God Genesis 3 verse 8 And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. From the beginning of time, God has always derived pleasure in revealing himself to man. We see this in the Garden of Eden as he visited Adam and Eve in the cool of the day to have fellowship with them. This went on until they sinned and God cast them out of his presence. You know, God is holy and sin cannot stand before him Sin separated humanity from God. God became inaccessible to man because of sin. However, man's sin did not stop God from reaching out to men. God kept revealing himself through diverse means. Until Jesus Christ came, every single time God revealed himself and his presence was made manifest, he always looked completely and utterly terrifying. 
When God appeared to Abraham, he appeared as a smoking oven, a smoking furnace of some sort moving through the air. Genesis 15 verse 17 and 18 And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. There was an unbelievable heat and unbelievable blaze. When Abraham met God, he saw a smoking furnace traveling through the pieces of the dead animal. God's presence at this time was absolutely terrifying, and not something so easy to behold. When Moses first had an encounter with God, he was afraid because God appeared to him as a burning bush. No normal human being would stand without being terrified at the sight of a burning fire and a roaring voice. Just imagine hearing the voice of God audibly and seeing a bush on fire, but the bush wouldn't burn up. Exodus 3 verse 2 And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. God's presence was terrifying. When Moses requested to see the glory of God, God did not show him his complete body. I will paraphrase the conversation between God and Moses in Exodus 33 verse 18 to 28. Moses said, Please, show me your glory. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of a rock, and I will cover you until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. No person can see God and live. This is one of the wonderful things about God. The level of power and glory he exudes cannot be withstood by any man. No human can look at him and live. What an amazing God we have. Do you know what Exodus 33 verse 20 tells me? It tells me that what God said in Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 was right. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God is so much higher than we can ever imagine or dream. Our human mind lacks the ability to have a full grasp of his greatness. The Bible tells us that when Moses came back from Mount Sinai, after seeing the back parts of God, his face radiated so much so that the people could not look him in the face for days. His face was so bright he had to put a veil over his face. The people didn't see God himself. It was only the radiation of his glory on Moses they saw, yet they couldn't stand it. Doesn't this tell you how powerful God is? Abraham and Moses were not the only ones who had an experience of how terrifying the presence of God is. Job also did. When God appeared to Job, he came in the form of a whirlwind. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, 
Job 38 verse 1 If you have ever been in a tornado, you know how truly terrifying that must have been for Job. Imagine being presented with the full force of nature in front of you. The frailty of our human structure and mind will quiver at the manifested presence of God. It isn't even something we can manage to stand. This was what happened when the manifested presence of God filled the temple in 2 Chronicles 5 verse 13 and 14. The priests could not stand. They couldn't even minister to God. The Bible refers to God as Almighty God. We can see why He is called Almighty God. There is a beauty and power in God that our human body cannot handle. With our current bodies, we cannot see God and still live. This is why God promises us that our bodies will be transformed into a glorious one before we would be able to behold Him. Our earthly bodies cannot enter heaven to be with God because they are corrupted by sin. So, God has designed a new body for every believer in Jesus Christ. This new body is incorruptible and immortal. This is why we will have glorified bodies at the rapture so that we can look at God, because God told Moses no one can see him and live. For us to see God and live, our bodies have to be glorified. Philippians 3 verse 21 Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things? At rapture, this sinful body will be swallowed up by God's glorious body, and we will be able to stand before him without any terror. Our natural body cannot behold God, because it is perishable, and cannot stand before the Father. This is why we will be given glorified bodies, which will be imperishable, pure, and in the likeness of Jesus himself. Our glorified bodies will make us stand in God's presence. Our Glorified Bodies have you ever thought what life would be like if your body never deteriorated? No forgetfulness or confusion, no limitations to learning, no decline in stamina or endurance. That will happen one day. You see, Gabriel won't be in heaven checking your blood pressure. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. That mortality might be swallowed up of life. For the believer, this new house is their glorified body. It is the building of God that was not made with hands, and that is eternal in the heavens. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? What a wonderful thing when God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to write me a book. It's an amazing thing that the Bible has stood the test of time. Men have rised up against it and every single one of those men have fallen. And yet the Bible till this very day is still standing. This book is still in the homes of millions and millions of people across the world. This book has changed nations. This book has changed countries. Every country, every nation that has risen against this book has failed. This book is the reference point to our soul. It is the anchor to our life. This book, the Bible, is God's library. To the weary pilgrim, the Bible is a good strong staff. To the one who sits in gloom, the Bible is a glorious light. To those who stoop beneath heavy burdens, the Bible is sweet rest. To him who has lost his way, the Bible is safe guide. To the discouraged, it whispers glad messages of hope. To those who are distressed by the storms of life, the Bible is an anchor. To those who suffer loneliness, the Bible reveals a God who sticks closer than a brother. And if you have come to know the God of this Bible, you will find it difficult to find the words to express worship and adoration to him. But today I want to focus on one verse. When the prophet Isaiah saw into the spirit world. Isaiah 6 chapter 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The prophet Isaiah was talking of what he saw. There are different verses of the Bible that talk about the appearance of God on his throne. I have read several of them and I have not seen one of them that says the glory of God is not great or just describes the glory of God as any old thing. The way God always appears is always something that is always compared to something great. John saw this same throne in the book of Revelation. Revelation 4 verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto emerald. Also in the Old Testament, God also appeared before the children of Israel in his glory. Exodus 24, 17, and the sight of the glory of God was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. When God appeared to the children of Israel, his voice was like of a trumpet and they could see thunder. This made them afraid and they could not face God. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18 and 19 states, and all the people saw thunderings and lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Isaiah was able to see God on his throne and the angels that surrounded his throne. He saw everything about God. After reading Isaiah 6 verse 1 carefully, I realized that the first thing that caught the attention of Isaiah was the one who was sitting on the throne. After talking about the person who he saw on the throne, he went ahead to explain the other things that he saw. 
Isaiah chapter 6 verse 2. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twine he covered his face. With twine he covered his feet. And with twine he did fly. Clearly there are other things around the throne. The Bible did not say everything was being shown to Isaiah one after the other. It wasn't a sequential showing. This means that everything came to him at once, at one time. What caught his eye was the throne and the one who was sitting on the throne. This means that this throne is very special. It is not something that you can just ignore. Everything else was secondary except the one who was sitting on the throne. For all we know, the prophet Isaiah could have spent a lot of time admiring that throne and the one who was sitting on that throne. We can't say. A throne is a seat occupied by an exalted person. This means the person who sits on the throne has the power to make anything happen in their kingdom. If anyone must stand in the presence of the person sitting on the throne, they must stand with the uttermost respect and approach with respect. Anything that anyone who sits on the throne says is final and no other power within that kingdom can go against it. Not everyone can sit on the throne. Only the person who has the authority in a place or a kingdom can sit on that throne. Only a ruler can sit on that throne. The throne that Isaiah saw is the throne of the whole universe. Everything in this universe, in this world, revolves around the throne of God. That's why his eyes were firstly drawn, not to the angels, not to everything else, but his eyes were drawn to the one sitting on the throne. Secondly, Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. If we are going to talk about the greatness of God, it's something that we can study for 10,000 years and still we won't reach the end of it. When we say God is great, it's not just a small phrase or an ordinary phrase. It's a big phrase. There is nothing we can compare to the greatness of God. He is highly exalted. He rules in the affairs of men. He knows everything. We talked about how the throne of God is great. What makes the throne of God great is the one who sits on the throne and that is God Almighty. And we see the name God Almighty in the Bible. And you know what that tells me? That tells me there is no one higher than him. That tells me there is no one greater than him. That tells me he's almighty, all-knowing God. First Chronicles 29 verse 11. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. The greatness of God surpasses the universe. If men cannot understand the whole mystery of the universe, what makes them think they can understand the God that made it? The one who sets everything in motion from the beginning of time. Everything that moves is because of him. Lightning flashes at his command. Rainfall comes and goes at his decree. He is completely in control at all times. The CEO of the universe. He is large and in charge. The king of all kings. The lord of all lords. The ruler and the creator. Truly, God is great. But God is not only great because of what he does in this universe and because of who he is. God is great because of what he does in your life. In your life. We are the children of God and we get to enjoy the greatness of God on a daily basis. He is showing his greatness in our lives every single day. Even if sometimes we don't see it. We sleep and wake up every day. And that is because of the greatness of God. To be able to go out of the house and to get back alive in this dangerous world is evidence of the greatness of God. God is sustaining you in a year like this. That is the greatness of God in your life. 
the challenges you have faced and the challenges you have overcome is evidence of the greatness of God in your life. The battles you have fought and the victories you have won is evidence of the greatness of God in your life. There are battles you have faced that you had no right to overcome. By all rights you should have been dead. But the greatness of God helped you to get the victory. The greatness of God is the reason why that crash didn't kill you. The greatness of God is the reason why you're still standing today. The greatness of God is the reason why you are more than a conqueror. Friends have left you, family have left you, yet you're still standing. I believe that all of us today can all agree that only God is great. And you know the wonderful thing is, even the angels agree with us. Even the angels bow down in worship at the greatness of God. Only God is great. But the truth is, everyone will bow now or in the future. Romans 14 verse 11 Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. The angels are in heaven now, Bowing before God because of His greatness, they are constantly bowing and praising Him. He is such a great God. E. V. Hill once said that the angels spend their day bowing before God and saying, Holy. They do this because once they lift up their heads and look at Him, He has done another great thing. Therefore they bow down and say, Holy. Our God is great. The angels in heaven know how great God is, but do you? We should learn from the angels and acknowledge the greatness of our God, because only God is great.